Hi, this is Fred Sroka. I'm here with the Golden Gate University School of Accounting, and I'm pleased to be joined by Rick Jose, our most recent full-time faculty member. Rick, welcome. Thank, Thank you for you. joining me. You know, uh, Rick, um, I have JDCPA after my name. You have more letters than you can shake a stick at. Could you briefly explain not just the CPA, mm -hmm. but the other certifications that you have? Sure, Fred. I'm happy to do that. Um, besides being a certified public accountant, I'm also a certified government management accountant. Um, I'm um, uh, certified in financial forensics. Uh, many thanks to Golden Gate University after my uh, obtaining my master's degree in forensic accounting pursued that as a CFF. Um, I'm also a certified in, in, uh, in information technology professional, a uh, certified information systems auditor, uh, certified internal auditor, certified fraud examiner, um, and also a licensed private investigator in the state of California. Wonderful. And your background includes time with FBI yes. and who knows what else, right? Yes, that's correct. I was in a police department at the FBI and law enforcement, yes. One of the things we're trying to bring to the School of Accounting is the incredible breadth, the incredible opportunities that are available in accounting right now. It's not right. yesterday's, I'm going to learn how to be an auditor, I'm going to be a tax person. Right. But there are all these wonderful worlds that are blossoming where really you can differentiate yourself in a hurry, right? That's right, that's right, that's right. right. As you bring these different programs to bear, what we're going to be doing is also connecting with our alumni mm -hmm. and trying to talk about how they can add more value to their clients. Correct. As we go through that, today's topic is just one of those topics, which is data security, how you deal with it. Yes, Fred. Uh, this is a, v a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. This is a topic that in the past two years when I was in public accounting just before I left to join uh, Golden Gate University, uh, it was a topic that was very difficult for some of my clients to work on. And I always ask them the first thing they should do is we as a CPA firm need to look in-house. Let me just give you a quick example of what happened. About two weeks ago, I get home from work. I opened a mail and it was a letter from a CPA firm I have never heard from, uh, I've never seen before. And I opened a letter and uh, there it was, uh, your data has been breached, we apologize, we audited uh, your pension plan when you were with such and such CPA firm um, and we, d we don't know how this has happened but, uh, you know, um, the, the forensic analysis we've done through an external firm uh, proves that our, our data, your data in specifically, has been stolen and here is a 12 months or 18 month uh, credit monitoring. Well, this is an issue that I believe all CPA firms need to look at from an in-house point of view. So. What are some of the things that we are asking you to do? Some of it is identify those critical confidential information that you house. Those could be information from your client. So, uh, for example, if you have tax clients, what are you doing about their information? How are you protecting their information? Um, how do you s uh, store that information on your servers? How do you... what? Uh, methodology or what technology are you using to ensure that that data is protected and what are you doing as far as data retention. Those are some of the very basic stuff. Um, also, what are you doing with respect to third-party uh, service providers? You know, for example, you may be sending your tax returns out to a third party to do some of the work for you before it comes back. So do you have those consents? Do you, um, how do you know that they are actually protecting the data and the integrity of the data as it's transmitted from your office to theirs and back? Right, and Rick, we care about this intensely because of our relationship with our clients. Absolutely. But we actually have a whole bunch of other reasons to really be scared, right? Which yes. is the government has a strong hand in this. Could you briefly Stronger. summarize what it is accountants should sure. be thinking about as they go through? Absolutely. So at Golden Gate University, we actually teach a course on business ethics. Um, and let me share with you one of the first one that we have the AICPA Code of Professional Conduct uh, a section, a subsection 1.700.001. And I think you have actually had an opportunity to look at that. And I think the audience, will, audience would appreciate just getting a feel for the background, the content of that. Well, it, it used to be that 
accountants felt they had one free gore, meaning if we've never had anything taken from us, or we've never lost all the data, right. then we must not be bad people. The problem is that the newer standard that's been codified suggests that if you haven't thought about it, if you haven't built a plan, the first time that you have a problem, you may already be subject to sanctions. So watching that and recognizing that you need to have thought about how you store data, you need to have proactively taken reasonable steps to protect it and to make sure that it isn't, number one, lost, that it isn't compromised, that it isn't stolen. Exactly. That's a critical part now of having public practice. And for those of, uh, those of you out there uh, that are, in fact, part of a CPA firm, as part of your peer review, there's certain critical questions that um, the peer review team will be asking. Oh, well, we have to be in compliance with our professional code of conduct. So I think that's really important to, to consider. To think about it for those of you who are actually have a tax practice. So the uh, Tax Internal Revenue Code section, uh, subsection 7216, again talks about data integrity, data security, and how you deal with that. Right, and even if it isn't a loss of the security, something as simple as offshoring, Offshore. the tax prep ran into a horrible problem. Um, my wife's old firm was outsourcing, and what they found was that even though the offshore accounting firm was an affiliate, mm -hmm. they needed to change their engagement letters at the last second to get specific client consent because the offshore entity was considered a third-party service provider. Correct. And that requires very specific consent. What's scary is the AICPA took those rules but then changed the definitions a bit. So I think we need to go through this one twice, right? <laughs> Just to make sure we are in compliance. Um, of course, never forget the Graham Leach Bliley Act, which also covers some of these um, information that I just shared with you with respect to confidentiality, storage, and protection of the data. The one that I really um, have um, uh, spent quite a bit of time on is the Federal Information Security Management Act, also known as the FISMA. The FISMA came out because of all these data breach, bre uh, breaches that we've had. Um, and as a result of the FISMA, what the United States government done through the uh, National Institute for Science and Technology, or NIST, uh, they came up with a cybersecurity framework. That was the really the result of that. Now, the FISMA, you may be asking yourself, wait a minute, but that really does apply to the federal government. What has that got to do with us? Well, if you have clients that are receiving federal grants, that will not excuse you or your clients from saying, well, we're, we're not really a federal government entity, therefore uh, that law does not belong to us. In fact, and from an attorney's perspective, you might want to look at it and speak to your attorneys, but based on a lot of conversations I have had with other attorneys, they said pretty much that's an extension. Uh, the FISMA will have an extension, an arm, all the way out to the local governments if they're receiving federal funds. So that is an area, and certainly, as I said, the, the framework for the cybersecurity was born because of the FISMA, or the Federal Information Security Management Act. Got it. So step one is, cobbler, take a look at your own shoes, sure. right? Which mm -hmm. is make sure that you, in the practice of public accounting, are thinking through what you've committed to to your clients, Correct. what you're doing to protect their information, mm -hmm. and then what the government standards are with respect to that information. That's right. That's right. Right. That's a cost center. Now let's talk about being able to go out and add value to our clients. A right. lot of our alumni are frustrated because they feel like all I'm doing is delivering a commodity, That's an right. audit report, a tax return. What you're trying to drive with all of these specialties is say you can deliver more value to your clients. You be can become more of a trusted advisor. Correct. Um, let's assume that our alumni really don't have much background there. What kind of conversation would you imagine you'd have, you'd recommend they have early on with their clients, particularly right after a tough, busy season? Sure. You know, uh, this is, that's, thank you for bringing this up because as part of added value, what we did at, at my old firm was having that conversation with the client to say, yes, we're doing your financial statement audit, but in addition to that, let me ask you a few questions. Uh, what information is confidential? Have you gone through your customer list? Have you identified you know, what customer data are sensitive and confidential? Have you looked at employee lists? Have you looked at trade secrets that you potentially are carrying? 
Uh, we actually had uh, two or three of the largest pension systems in the state of California's clients. Well, guess what? There was quite a few, uh, you can call it customer list uh, or you can call it um, uh, pension recipients, as well as their information, uh, what we call PII or personally identifying information that was that had to be protected. So the question for my client was always, do you know what your confidential information are and have you identified those? The second thing we went through is how do you store those? How do you, what physical security are you using to ensure the, the storage of this information is accurate? So look at physical security, okay? As part of the walkthrough, general within a financial statement audit, as part of the IT review, you will be looking at the physical security anyway. Look at data encryption. Is data encrypted at rest and during transit? And how is it encrypted? Is it an old encryption system? Is it a, a newer encryption, encryption system at 256 encryption? So those are important. Uh, backup, do you have hot side? Do you have cold side? Do you have warm side? And those are again all important to discover and speak to them about. So backup, is it daily? Is it hourly? Is it by minute? Do you have redundancy of the data? Those are again all the uh, conversations you want to have with them. Another area that is becoming very apparent to most of us is use of Wi-Fi. Uh, certainly at Golden Gate University, we have Wi-Fi for employees, we have Wi-Fi for classrooms, we also have Wi-Fi for our guests who visit the campus. All of these Wi-Fi's are actually in various zones. So if an employee is atta attaching their device to the Wi-Fi, it's not the same segment or zone as we call it, as a guest who will be coming in, it's completely a separate subnet of that Wi-Fi system. Are you using password? Those password, are they expiring? Is it a one, two, three, four, five, six type of a password? Are you using complexity that's actually part of the Windows Active Directory as part of that? So again, some of these examples are good conversations to have with your clients. What are they doing about it? Send an advisory board for cyber resilience, and if I remember correctly, a high percentage of all passwords are either password correct. or lowercase or correct. one two three four five six. Yes, that's very <laughs> correct. And in fact, I do put up every time those reports come out. I do put it on my LinkedIn page because I think it's important for everybody to take a look at it. Right. If we're relying on that skin system, we have to think carefully about: Do we have basic protection? Correct. But you know, so now you say yes, Rick. We we talk to the client, and the client says, "Yeah, we have a lot of problems." And you know, how do we fix this? How do we address the potential leaks in our system? And again, this is remember, this is from your client's perspective. Right. So, I say fixing leaks is something the Trump administration is having an incredibly and, hard time with. That's right, and if things are coming out. So hopefully, and I'll, you know, and again, would that be a physical security? Probably not. But the second point is, look at your employees. Look at the former employees. Those who have grudges against you because they don't like the way you operate, because they are not being treated very well, that is still number one threat against cybersecurity employees that want to prove a point or former employees because they were discharged. Uh, they still have access. We, we are kind of, the clients could be a little bit slow at terminating access. Those are potential leaks. Uh, database, base, uh, database protection in one of our classes, um, accounting information system, we talk about databases, structures of the databases, how do you protect databases. So that's an important concept to understand and for those of you who may or may not understand that, that's a great opportunity to take some initiative and look at some of these courses and see how those data protection could be helpful. So our IT professionals probably set up a nice database that everybody can access, but Correct. that means anybody who can get through a path password can download everything. Absolutely. You might protect certain fields, restrict certain fields, or you might stop if anybody says, tell me everything in the database That's right. and ask a few more questions. And I would always give the example of never forget the biggest leak in the U.S. Uh, intelligence history, uh, Edward Snowden. Um, someone with full access to the database was able to download gigabits of, in, of information, perhaps terabytes of information, and was able to share that with the enemy. So database protection, please um, consider that. This is really serious. That is where all these PII we just talked about resides. Uh, ransomware continues. Three years in a row, ransomware continues to be an issue in the United States, and we talk about that. Right. A friend of mine had their laptop 
-hmm. basically encrypted by some by clicking a wrong Correct. button, not realizing what they were doing. Their computer got locked. I instantly said, I need to address that. So I went and got the special in the cloud backup. <laughs> I just realized before we started recording this that my password for retrieving it is on my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> so that may not help much. And, and ransomware actually has caused two hospitals in Los Angeles to completely sh had to, sh well, they didn't shut down Fortunately, What they did was they actually paid it. Now, ransomware is extremely interesting because what they do is, uh, you know, the bad guys generally keep the dollar amount very close to your reco the point of recovery. So they find your break-even point and they're slightly b below the break-even point to make sure you pay the dollar rather than going through all the process of uh, getting all that information back again through your backup process. So it's easy for them to say, I will charge you, give me $900,000 and I'll give you the encryption key. In the case of these two hospitals in Los Angeles, they both said, you know what, this is much better than uh, us continuing to have to go through the backup and be down for so many days. Again, please talk to your clients about ransomware. What are they doing with worms? Phishing exposure. Um, this is with a phishing exposure. It's really interesting because that's where a lot of our clients uh, get an email and employee receives an email. Looks very innocent. It comes from a friend potentially. Their email could have been hacked. They click on it. Oh, take a look at this great news story I just found. They click on it and the worm automatically starts to get into their system. And then guess what? That computer is on the network. Now the entire network could potentially get the worm through it. And it was actually just two months ago that Golden Gate University employees got something from Golden Gate University payroll department saying please click here and when I saw it I was curious I called found out that it yeah. was exactly that a fishing exposition that exposition that's yeah. going there and we sent a note out to everybody saying for Pete's sake delete this and I think our data people were able to get it so the answer is you have to be proactive correct. but any one employee could cause a problem right There's, that's absolutely correct and again I always go back to the uh, bullet number two employee and former employees the current employees even it's innocent they don't mean to do this but because we don't have enough education around this that seems to be an issue it looks harmless as you mentioned it comes from the payroll department oh maybe something I need to attend to and that's what happens uh, the two last ones that I really emphasize on laptop security most of you um, either at the firm or some of your clients and even these days we do carry our laptops around with us please use the encryption if you're using a Mac for example most of us in education love our Mac system um, Macs, generally speaking, come with a, a vault which has an encryption. You just activate it. It um, doesn't cost you anything. It's just a matter of you creating the key and activate it. So laptop security. Uh, a few years ago, you may recall a very large bank uh, in the East Bay had a lot of customer data on one of their laptops overnight with a, with a vendor. Um, and that particular vendor was somehow breached overnight uh, through uh, for a theft a laptop was stolen and the data was uh, of course gone and that was a lot of embarrassment for the, this particular bank again I want to emphasize these are very simple solutions that you can do email security is the last one I want to bring up and that is really we are getting so used to our emails and we can't live without our emails but think about security what are you encrypting the data what are you doing about email security and how are you ensuring when you are transmitting information sensitive information to your clients that information is encrypted that they are the only one who can open that email got it as you take a look at addressing leaks that's the reactive stuff right that's the being the maintenance man right really when I hear you talk about what are our alumni should be doing with their clients. It's more about being proactive, right? Mm -hmm. It's being That's the correct. architect rather than the maintenance, maintenance person. person. Could you briefly go through what you see as an effective way of approaching mm -hmm. planning for IT security? Absolutely. And so this is where I used to sit down after all these conversations and having discussions. Uh, we provided a plan to our clients, and I would highly recommend you would do the same thing with your clients. So take a look at the data protection audit. What are they, what, as part of the audit process process 
audit their data protection. Now, you can use AICPA guides such as SOC 1, Service Organization Control 1, Service Organization Control 2. You can use a combination of those. You can take a look at other frameworks uh, such as framework from ISACA, COBIT. So again, you need to look at the data protection and audit that to ensure that there is there's some kind of a security me mechanism around the data that's protecting that data from being hacked or being maliciously removed um, for the wrong reasons, really. Record retention, storage, and backup policies, generally those are very easy. You can take a look at what backup procedures they have and audit those or help them audit those to make sure that these are in, in, uh, in line with industry standards. Depending on the size of your client, the nature of the work they do, Obviously, the cost has to be a, 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 an issue that you will think about, and you will discuss those costs with your clients. Although the cost goes sky high if you get hit with a subpoena, right, to produce documents. That's very true. And so having some kind of records retention that doesn't say we'll save everything forever, if it's part of your business policies, you're Correct. fine. If it's to not have to respond to a particular summons you're a bad person. That's right. Now, one firm, one CPA firm, um, actually very local to us, a regional CPA firm, I spoke with one of their attorneys, and uh, his recommendation is don't keep things more than 12 months, first of all, and that is their policy. They don't like to keep things more than 12 months, um, and I, I've never, you know, maybe a little bit longer would be better, but especially when you're done with your project, get rid of everything you don't need. If it's not in your data warehouse, let, get, let, uh, let it go because that's going to cause problems. So data retention, however policy you want to come in with, and I really, I'm not an attorney, certainly Fred is, but I really would like you to think about those with your clients and see what data record retention policy is applicable to your clients. Certainly if you're a government entity, there's uh, like education, I, my recollection is seven years had to be, some of these data had to be around. So there are some laws around that. As a tax person, tax returns forever, supporting files for seven years, I think was our rule of thumb took care of the state statute of limitations, the limitations as well. right? right. But at least spend some time talking with your client about what's the longest you've ever had to go back, when did you hate yourself for not having the data, I agree. when did you hate yourself for having the data. That, that's, that's very true. When did you hate yourself for having the data? Again, as a former FBI agent, I was always interested in what the client has. So my subpoenas, when I wrote them, uh, I wanted to make sure I can get as much data as I can possibly can get. Now, if the client didn't have it, there's nothing I can do about it. But if they did, I would definitely love to see that. So, again, that's a conversation to have. Data en encryption policies, I cannot emphasize this enough. Uh, from a laptop, from the database itself, to the network, uh, just think about that in a large, even on your backup systems, what data encryption are you using? Um, we also talk about access policies and restrictions. Think about access policies as such. Should Fred have access to the kingdom? Well, although the Fred is the dean of the School of Business, he perhaps does not need access to entire Golden Gate University's database. Does Rick Josiah need access to the entire uh, Golden Gate University? The answer is no. So there are people that you have to identify and have the policy written in a way that makes sense for the business to continue to operate. And you don't want to stop the business because people don't have access to a certain types of uh, information to, for them to do their job. So I think access policy is very important, especially like, for example, with tax returns. My old question always was for our tax folks, how are you guys protecting the data? How do I know that if I'm not working in this particular tax return, I will have access? Because some softwares out there don't actually have the restrictions that you want. So you might want to have that discussion internally about that. And I don't know if you have... I went to work for a big four firm, and we had an intern type in format star dot star on our shared drive. drive. And that changed my behavior for a long time forward. Right. First thing I did when I came here was I pulled a copy of all of what is our course content, sure. and I moved that off-site, and then I periodically back it up, knowing the university has systems, but not fully trusting <laughs> that the university has complete systems. <laughs> and, you know, even on your flash drive, Fred, even if you carry a flash drive, and I have a flash drive with a lot of my course content, my exam, I encrypt that, um, and the encryption is actually free. I use the Microsoft 
um, a bit locker uh, that comes with Microsoft, uh, I believe, started in um, Office, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Windows 7. Um, so Windows 7, if you have Windows 8.1, Windows 10, uh, which is much better now, but use the BitLocker. It's inexpensive, costs you actually nothing. Um, and you can easily encrypt your data, including your little thumb drives. Right, and then if you're having conversations with your clients, you can say, if a salesperson says, please give me the entire customer list of the organization, maybe you want to hit, say, let's hit a stop button right there, right? That's this right. is the level at which you need to be thinking proactively rather than reactively. Reactively, correct. And, and so that becomes the communication policy and what you want to um, communicate with your, as Fred mentioned, from the sales standpoint and what you want to do. Now, one other thing that I think it's really important, uh, we talked about the email and how you want to exchange information. My strong recommendation to you and your colleagues and your clients are is, is to use secure file sharing platforms. There are a number of them out there, and I'm not going to really sit here and advertise for one platform versus the other, but I would just say if you just do the Google search and say secure file sharing platforms, you're going to find a number of them. Please use your better judgment. Uh, make sure you get demonstrations. Make sure you review their SOC 1 and SOC 2 to ensure the auditors, the CPAs who audit these platforms, come back to you and say, yes, this platform actually meets those standards from the AICPA. Um, and it's really important for you to do your due diligence before you choose a platform for uh, secure file sharing. But enforce that and work with your, and maybe enforcement is not the right phrase here, but help your clients understand how important it is to use the right type of platform for the data share. Redacting unneeded information, I think in tax returns you guys would do that a lot. Certainly in certain government information you want to you know, redact uh, certain uh, PII information. Uh, to give you an example, in my class um, I really show my students how to remove social security numbers, pertinent information data, date of birth. Um, how do we do that? Because you may get a flat file from your client and you need to go through this flat file, organize it in a way that you can analyze it, but there's certain information there may not be necessary and you want to use and, and remove and redact those. Right, and when we sent partner K1s out, right. what we were doing, the version that we sent to the government and to the client for their files, clearly that needed the complete taxpayer identification number. But all the other versions, boy, we're sending things out where we don't have control over how they're going to get delivered, Correct. where they're going to get delivered. That's right. They probably go out to lawyers and accountants, who knows who else. So we would actually do a separate redacted version with maybe only the last four digits showing. Mm -hmm. But the idea of saying it's worth doing another run, putting X's into those first few digits, saved us at least a couple of embarrassing problems, problems downstream. downstream. And I think it's the same thing when you think about data analysis and when you're thinking about how, what information do I need to have in this data because again you don't want to be that CPA firm that had to send me a letter to say oh I'm so sorry but your information was um, basically stolen off our networks. I mean I don't know how else to put it but that's, that was a nicer way, uh, that was a better way for them to put it to me. Um, and uh, there's a couple more points. One is the confidentiality agreements that you want to make sure there is some kind of an NDA or non-disclosure agreements, confidentiality agreements between yourself, your clients, and the TPSPs that we talked about earlier. So you have these third parties out there, services that are providing it. Make sure these confidentiality agree agreements, NDAs are in place. So that again ensures if the data is breached, what are some of the uh, consequences or what are some of the actions they need to take? Right, and you're still probably responsible. If you Absolutely. share the information with another professional in the U.S. or even an affiliate overseas, it's your problem if they don't do the right things to protect it. But right. that never happened to you, did it? Never no, happened to good. me. Good. Um, and it's really interesting because I have had this happen to me now two or three times uh, where my personal information was stolen, no fault of mine, but unfortunately, I would say in this case, the TPSP was negligent and we'll see where that goes. Um, but it's, it's also embarrassing for that firm to have this on their record to show that something like this happened. Lastly, uh, and I think this is the most important part. So now you have been hacked. Now you have been compromised. Do you have an incident response plan 
in order for you to execute that and ensure that the right people are in the right places, the right people are being contacted, how do you go out, what was damaged. To give you a couple of examples, identify attorneys that actually specialize in this area so you can immediately contact and say, what do I need to do, we need to execute, whatever we need to execute. Second, hire a, an, or at least have in mind a firm that does um, more of the forensic analysis of your network. What just happened? How did this happen? And then have those policies in there. If you end up with a ransomware, what is your uh, incident response plan to get out of a ransomware? Are you going to pay it? You're not going to pay it? Bottom line, every single minute you're out of business, uh, it's going to cost you money. And every and moment important. that you don't react by advising your clients or customers, Absolutely. you probably increase the risk of damage. And going back to what the AICPA now demands, your failure to know what you were going to do when something bad happened may indicate you failed to deal with your duty up front. That's right. And there are very good incident response plans. I have drafted a, a number of them for my clients, but I think those are very important for um, our audience to consider. And again, it's part of the, something that I believe it should be covered in, and in fact, I, we do cover that in our accounting information system course, just to ensure that uh, our, our students understand what and how they can come back and advise their clients. Got it. So wait until the horse gets stolen. That's a terrible time to lock your That's barn. That's a terrible time. Think about reasonable controls on data up front internally, reduces your risk. Yes. And then as long as you're doing it, why not make it a value add when you go out to your clients? That's right. At the very worst, you can say, I told you so, and hopefully instead you wind up saving them from a horrible problem. That's downstream. right. And I think that is a very good way of summing everything we just talked about. Wonderful. Hey, Rick, thanks so much. Thank you for having me.